Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. And today we are joined with who I believe to be the best salesperson of all time. Right? <laughs> you said that perfectly. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. No, no. no. So Enzo Di Michelle, um, currently working at Neural Impact, who are a company that help other sales teams sell better. And we'll get to that. But what we're kind of super interested in is Enzo's history. Uh, actually referred by another guest, Mr. Patrick Hogan on Multivista. Um, Enzo's been in the sales game for quite a while, over 20 years, yeah, and absolutely. has led various sales teams. So let's dig into that. Enzo, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for inviting me and uh, happy to be here. So my first question is to try and understand how you moved from the actual selling into leadership, management, and operations. Uh, probably not that uh, different a journey. Uh, I got into sales, uh, B2C sales, so um, our B2B sales story, and uh, had some really success, really determined or realized early on that I was what I would call an unconscious competent. I was good at it, but really couldn't describe why or help other people get better at it. Um, so it didn't take very long as companies do. They they promote uh successful salespeople. So I got into sales management and sales leadership. Uh, and then it wasn't too long after that before I became a, a VP of sales, a sales leader for uh, a medium-sized, tech, well, a smaller technology, Canadian technology company. Um, soon after joining that organization, the sales team, which was mostly inside sales, started bringing me in on deals. So end of month, end of quarter deals, those sorts of deals that were at risk. And we started winning them. Uh, so our, our win weight went up on went on went up on those, and what started happening is that uh, our quarter end or our month end uh, sales parties or sales events, the team started giving me um, superhero t shirts, which at first was kind of cool, it was sort of flattering, but it didn't take very long, Tom, to realize you know that's not good. <laughs> I can't be that guy, and I wasn't doing very much uh, to help the team to get better. We were getting better at closing deals, or we we're winning more deals. Uh, so it was at that point that I realized the sales ops or sales enablement process was good, but it was tactical and we needed to go broader and deeper. So um, uh, that's how I got into it. I started to develop the tools and the processes around that. That was also the time, Tom, when I first realized that uh, sales leadership or sales management enablement was really lacking. Got it. Awesome. And then fast forward to your work today. How do you guys help sales organizations? Um, well, uh, so we've got a, a, a broad spectrum of offerings uh, in terms of processes, tools, training, constructs, those kinds of things. So it does vary from client to client, but um, really it always begins with the same thing. And it's actually not too different from working as a VP of sales or a sales manager, uh, understanding the the team, that is what the team's talents and skill sets are, They're doing an assessment of what they've got and what they need, and then building some tools and processes and training around that. Uh, and, and I said sales teams, but it's also sales and sales management. Awesome. And do you recommend like a best-in-class sales stack when you're going to clients? Do you have these X amount of tools that, that you say are the top ones? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question, Tom. And uh, I get that question pretty regularly. As actually the the things that you and I have talked about, I hear those questions regularly. So as far as the stack is concerned, the specific products uh, or the specific tools, no, I don't really recommend something. Um, but I do recommend, and we do work with clients, and it does vary from client to client. But uh, a CRM tool for sure. And then a BI tool that enables sales and sales management. And then either the same BI tool or a different BI tool that um, that's focused on marketing. So planning, executing, and tracking marketing results. In addition to the technology stack, we do recommend. So whether I'm a, a, a sales leader or in my current capacity as a management consultant, there the, the stack should also include some IP, some um, uh, tools, training processes, scripts, those kinds of things to help and playbooks to help the team take the, the learnings and those new skill sets and execute those in a repeatable and predictable way. Sure. And then on that point, 
uh, executable and repeatable. Yeah. What can, can you share something maybe from a previous experience on something you've done along those lines that have directly improved productivity of the reps? Oh, geez, for sure. Uh, there's a ton of things, but one of the most important, I would say, is the the prospect engagement model. So there is a very specific model that the audience engages with in terms of um, becoming interested in what we're talking to them about. And that's a series of phone calls and emails. And there's probably there's a six or seven step process that allows salespeople to effectively reach out to prospects. So whether they are cold prospects or people that have come into your website. So that's one of them. And so that model is uh, six or seven steps. Those are scripted. Uh, and, and they're scripted depending on the, the prospect or the customer that we're working with. Um, and that, that becomes actually a, a cross between a construct, meaning giving the, the, the salespeople and the sales managers ideas about how to execute this. And then there's also specific scripts, say these things and say them in this order. Uh, that is one of the things in our world, by the way, we work with Microsoft business partners. That's one of the things that they get the most value out of. Um, because it makes it easier, it makes it cookie cutter for them. Got it. So what you're saying is that if every rep has the same steps that they should move through in order Absolutely. to engage prospects, that so are, are you saying that now that you go into clients and people don't have that in place, and that's one of the first things you recommend? Uh, yeah, that's right. So yes to both of those things. There is a very specific model that helps salespeople be more successful in that. Uh, and then the second is that most pros- I'm sorry, most uh, B2B sales organizations, especially in the SMB market, don't have that in place. They, they leave it up to the salesperson and their natural talent or their, their ability to communicate and then their sales managers to help them do that. So that probably is one of the most important and one of the things that we get asked the most to do. Got it. Right now, uh, we're now sales teams are being thrown into disarray, sales reps working remote for the first time in their lives. From because I assume this hasn't happened with any of your in-house teams before, before, from your work with clients, what are you seeing you know, the major challenges for sales reps and sales leaders right now? Um, so I knew you were going to ask this question, Tom, and I really thought about how do I take what's in my head and make it uh, digestible. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to give you a fulfilling answer, but I'm going to do my best. Uh, first thing I'm going to say is that, look, I realize that what's going on is, is freaking people out. And I would say rightfully so. Um, one of the things that we've heard a lot, and it actually kind of gets under my skin, is people will say, you know, how are you doing in these unprecedented times? These are not unprecedented times. In recorded history, a fairly recent recorded history, there have been more than two dozen global pandemics. That doesn't include recessions, significant recessions, and depressions. So the results of all those things are pretty consistent in that they affect people's health and mortality rates, but it also affects businesses' ability to do business. So we're talking about sales. We're talking about sales and sales leadership. Those are tough gigs, Tom, and they've always been tough gigs. So the stuff that we're dealing with today is, you know, different than what it was a couple of years ago, but it's just change. It's impacting sales and sales leadership. And um, so the answer to your question is helping sales and sales managers be successful starts with, first of all, reminding them to not panic. This isn't weird. This is just slightly different. And then number two, holding people accountable, holding ourselves and our people accountable, and then reverting to what we've always done. And that is doing the internal and external assessments. What are our people good at? What do we have? What do we need? What do we re- need to redevelop? And then the second piece is how are our buyers behaving? In this particular case, our buyers are behaving a little bit differently and it needs more remote uh, selling. But the fact is, current and uh, millennial kind of salespeople do this anyway. This is not new news. Uh, so this is taking the stuff that's in our head and making it predictable, giving people scripts and, and constructs. So the difference between a construct and a script, a script is say these words, right? A construct is in these kinds of things, do these kinds of things. So it gives you a chance to build in your own personal uh, art and, and skill set or uh, talent into what you're saying. So I said a lot of words, Tom, I hope I answered your question. Uh, it's a really refreshing answer, actually. 
Um, oh, thanks. Perspective that I haven't heard, not on this podcast, yeah. but actually anywhere on LinkedIn or anywhere. So I, I did quite enjoy that response. Oh, awesome. Thanks. Over the past few weeks, we've spoken to a hundred sales leaders around the world to understand the impact of COVID-19 on revenue. And we've combined these insights into one single report that covers the immediate impact, the commercial outlook, the tech stack that you need, and actionable advice for sales leaders. You can claim this whole report completely for free if you go to ebster.com forward slash COVID. That's ebster.com forward slash COVID. Also, as the George Costanza thing, I should probably end the iPod, right? Like, so you, or the podcast, you end on a high note. now. <laughs> <laughs> um, specifically on remote selling, as you said, the, the millennial sellers or a lot of salespeople sell like this anyway. Mm-hmm. But is, is there anything that you would share to help a sales operations person listening who's trying to engage and improve productivity of reps remotely that you think could help them? Uh, yes. Yeah. Again, I'm not sure it's unique to this, but I think it's a little bit more pronounced in this current model is that, I mean, people are working from home. So there are different things that get in the way of that. Uh, The dog, the kid, somebody knocked on the door, uh, whatever. So the first thing is, I would say, well, do that assessment. What are our people good at? What do they need? And then create a, a process and a set of tools around that. Tools or guidelines, let's say that. Uh, and then give the team, the salespeople and the sales managers, a model that they can follow that can help keep them on track. Again, that doesn't have to be a recipe, like a specific half a teaspoon of this, stir clockwise, that kind of stuff. It can be a model and with reminders that, that lets the team in their own mind formulate what that process is going to be like from triaging a lead to making that first call. And then where do I want to take that? Meaning if you can give that sort of a roadmap to your team, it helps us as salespeople and sales managers stay on track. And that helps uh, separate from the noise, the dog, the kid, the door, that kind of thing. So it helps people keep on track. And it also gives us that roadmap. Where am I going with this? One of the things I think I'm seeing is um, what I'm calling extemporaneous selling or ad hoc selling. Uh, It's easy to be relaxed about what we're doing. But if I have a model, if I have a roadmap, it helps make things a little bit more structured. And I think that that'll help people. The other thing, and this is probably my personal preference, but Tom, I'm sure you've seen a bunch of, or you've been, you've done a lot of work like this, where the person that is talking is way too relaxed. You know, they're wearing their house coat or, or whatever the heck it is. So just a reminder to have some structure, have some professionalism about this. The good thing about this kind of work is that it, it humanizes us. That's good. Um, too much humanizing uh, makes us seem like we don't know, really know what we're doing. So be professional. Uh, be human, but be professional and have a plan. Um, you know, we hire salespeople and sales managers because they're good at what they do. Uh, so I think we should trust that and then give them some guidance about how to deal with uh, the new tools. Sure. Now, looking at forecasting, have you seen, like, how can a sales ops or sales leader forecast right now? Have you, you have any tips on how people could do that effectively with all the uncertainty? Yeah, that's probably the, the second or third most common thing that uh, we deal with uh, today. The, the first thing, I'm going to take a step back and just talk about how current events have affected pipelines and forecasts. So two things. Pipeline is everything that we're working on in the funnel, regardless of qualification or timeline. Forecast is the deals that we've decided that we're going to apply some value to and that we believe the buyer will make a decision within a defined time frame, whether that's 30, 60, 90 days, six months, whatever it is. So whatever our sales cycle is. So the first thing that we saw was that overall pipeline didn't change, but the 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 probability of close of the forecast deals got longer. We lost, you know, it, it, you see some deals get uh, fall off the forecast and that, you know, it might come by, come back sometime in the future. So the recognizing that the pipeline didn't really change, some deals fell off or they, they delayed, but other deals are coming in, new types of businesses coming in. And, and I've heard this on uh, some of your uh, uh, 
uh, your guests have spoken on this podcast, that's happening, right? So in my business, for example, we're getting more business opportunities for remote training. And rather than be in front of a customer for two or three days of face-to-face training in a workshop, we're doing uh, the same sort of content, slightly modified, but split out over two or three months of smaller digestible webs, uh, webinars. So, you know, my advice or, or my guidance is hold the course, recognize what we're good at, recognize what our buyers are going through, and then uh, manage your deals accordingly. So some of the value proposition or the output will change, i.e. more webinars for us. But uh, overall, I don't, I mean, there was a temporary drop in forecast in closed deals, but I, we see that coming back. And I think that 2021 is going to be a pretty remarkable year. Um, I, I don't think I'm, a, I'm an eternal optimist. I just think I'm a realist. I think that those deals that got uh, pushed are going to come in at the end of this year, come in in 2020. And then we've got this other business that's happening now. So my advice is uh, stay the course, be pragmatic, uh, understand what your team is doing, understand what they're good at, understand what they need, and then really understand your buyer's motivations. What are they doing? Why are they doing it? And how do we align our process to um, uh, or our engagement model to, to align with them? Stay the course, a very uplifting note. <laughs> yeah. um, Don't freak out, right? I say that almost every day. Let's not freak out. We're good. Um, and then on forecasting in general, from previous experience, what have you found to be the most effective process to, to do that accurately? Um, the most effective process, ish. That, that's a great question. Um, I know what I'm trying to say, but the words are all rushing to get out of my mouth here, Tom. So uh, uh, again, not that much of a change. I'm going to say that the three most important metrics that I look at are uh, commit. So what deals are we committing? What deals are we considering upside? And then uh, win rates. Those those three things, and I'm going to say regardless of the, the economic or uh social model that we're dealing with, looking at those things and then looking at forecasts and forecasting. What does the buyer need? Why do they need it? What have they described as their buying process and how have we aligned our selling process? So if we can understand those things, then we can decide where are we now? What do we do next? So again, not very, not black magic when it comes to forecasting. Three things, right? What are we committing? What do we think is upside? And, um, uh, you know, and then how are we looking at it? You know, where are we in the deal and what are we doing with it? Oh, I'm sorry. And uh, our close rates, right? If a salesperson tells me that they're going to close this deal, if they've got an 80 or 90% close rate, then the rest of my forecast review on that deal changes. If a rep is telling me that they're going to close a deal and their close rate is 20%, then it's going to be a little bit more, uh, let's say, a little more invasive of a discussion. Got it. And so the next question on on like favorite KPI, the metrics, I think we, you mentioned three, right? So how how much are we committing? What is the runway and what is the upside? And so you're saying that those are the three. If you could only choose, then you would choose those three. Yeah, I would do that, right? What are we committing? So, you know, you're betting that this deal is closing. Uh, what, is, what are the possible deals? So deals where we believe that the buyer is going to make a decision, but the deal we've got some belief that we could win or, or we can see a path to victory. Uh, and then the third is historically, what is the, the win rate? And regardless of the economic or, or social climate, those are the three things that I most often look at. Sure. And then a final question is about who in the world of sales operations or leadership that you would like to take to lunch. Could be someone that you've known and worked with before or could be someone aspirational. Right. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus my, my answer on three people that have actually figured prominently in my life. And like people on your podcast, I've been blessed to, to work with some great people and um, uh, to learn things to do and things to not do. Uh, so I'm going to give you three people that, uh, that I'll, I'll, I'll put forward here. The first, and this is pretty non-standard, I'm going to say is my dad. Um, 
dad was a maintenance mechanic in a heavy uh, manufacturing industry, and he was a contractor. So not a typical sales guy. In fact, not a sales guy at all. But dad, you know, taught my brothers and me that if there's a job to do, do it. Get out of your way and do it. Don't panic. Don't freak out. Uh, just do the job. And once you start doing the job, you'd be surprised at how well the job gets done. So that's the first thing. Uh, the next two, I'm going to say, are really good friends of mine. I've known them for years and years and years are Glenn Hazen and Mark Stewart. Both of those guys have tremendous talent. So talent, the stuff that God gave us, the thing that's part of who we are. But they've taken that talent and they've really developed and continue to develop their skills, learning. Um, and they, they approach it in the same way. And that is understanding what buyers, behaviors and motivations are. If we can understand what a buyer is doing and why they're doing that, then it makes it easier to sell to that person. Empathy is one of the most important things we can show to our buyers and understanding what they're doing and why they're doing it is, um, uh, is critically important. And both Glenn and Mark have really shown that to me. Um, I, and they're great friends of mine. In fact, uh, I'm hoping to see Mark here next week. So he's in Vancouver. I'm in Toronto. I'm hoping to go out there and see him. Fantastic. Awesome. Let me summarize a few things that I picked out here. Um, okay. My, my favorite point, uh, as I mentioned already, is your view on the situation and how actually maybe a lot of these deals that have been pushed out and all the salespeople are, are really are concerned about probably would come in at the end of this year or next year. So I, I really like that point. Next was quite a simple point that actually reps need a consistent template for prospecting for every other channel. And that, and if you don't have that in place, that's like the first thing. I, I, so I thought that's quite a, a fundamental piece, but also very important. And then finally, your, the framework you have for working with reps or working with sales teams. What are we good at? What do the reps need? And then from that, providing tools and guidelines for them to improve. Um, so Enzo, anything else you'd like to share? Um, yeah, just on... Uh... So one of the things that we've, I work with Microsoft and the Microsoft business partners globally and uh, through years of research and working with these partners, and this is pretty consistent. Well, I'm going to say very consistent globally. In that SMB space, there are seven moments that matter in a sales cycle, uh, starting from the very first prospecting call all the way through. And there are things that are absent in those moments that matter. Uh, if you talk to a rep who isn't as aware of what a sales cycle looks like, they would say that demos are very important. Well, demos are not one of the most important uh, moments that matter in a sales cycle. Uh, but there are, there's another part, and then there's a piece in the middle there where reps panic. And that is when the sale go, or when the buyer goes quiet. So we either think that we've won the deal or we've lost the deal. And what salespeople do when that happens, it, usually tip the work often tips a deal over. So especially in today's day and age, when things are quiet or deals are getting pushed, you know, we're probably in that space. They're quiet. Maybe we think we've won. Maybe we think we've lost. What do we do or don't do? So that's a critical piece. Um, and it does vary from partner to partner what their sales cycle looks like, but that's actually an important part of the sales cycle. But, um, you know, most deals are either won or lost because of things we did or didn't do. Uh, or we get objections because of things that we did or said. So uh, when it gets quiet, we got to be careful about that. It is such a quick, critical time, isn't it? Yeah. It's yeah, yeah. hard to know. Do you send that final follow-up or do you just leave it? Yeah. Um, well, we're left, for, we're left with our own demons, right? And uh, yeah, uh, just be calm. Be exactly. calm, carry on. Yeah. And I'd like to finish. So there was one phrase you used that I actually didn't write down that you said you were saying every day these days. I think it was just hang in there. Yeah. Be calm. Don't panic. We're good. You're good. I'm good. We're good. <laughs> and with that, Enzo, thank you so much for coming on the show. Hey, thanks, Tom. I really enjoyed it. I uh, appreciate the invitation and it was great to talk to you.